Hi, welcome everyone. I am Jennifer Henius with the LGBTQ Caregiver Center, which is a new resource that aims to raise awareness of the unique challenges faced by LGBTQ caregivers and those who care for LGBTQ individuals. We empower LGBTQ caregivers to live with pride and dignity and serve as a conduit for education, wellness, training, and research. The center provides information and resources, delivers training and innovative services to enhance the health and wellness of LGBTQ caregivers. And today I am so pleased to be joined by Dr. Whitney Wharton, who is a cognitive neuroscientist specializing in Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. She received her bachelor's from the University of Texas at Austin and went on to complete her doctoral training at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. She has completed her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and is currently on faculty at the Department of Neurology at Emory University School of Medicine. And we are also joined today by Kelly Lykos, who is a researcher who works closely with Dr. Wharton at the Wharton Lab. And thank you so much, Kelly, for joining us this morning as well. Um, would you mind sharing just a little bit about your background too? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my name is Kelly and I have a master's in public health. I graduated from the University of Florida in 2020 um, and came here to work in research. And um, I'm interested in getting everyone involved in research and making people more comfortable accessing research. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you both so much for being here. We're super excited and I am really looking forward to learning a bit more about your background and your research interests and this particular study, which we're going to be talking about today, equality and caregiving. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Warden. Sure, thank you so much for having us and congratulations on, on your new initiative. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand offline and, and this, is, this is so needed and um, you know, allies like yourself and your organization are, are so much appreciated. And you know, what, we, what we try to do in our lab and at Emory um, is really kind of make this a joint, you know, a joint team effort because there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work, but to date there hasn't been um, you know, a national concerted effort regarding LGBTQ health as it pertains to aging. Um, so, so that's really that, that's really what we're trying to do. So, I appreciate all the good work that you're doing. Um, so, I can start off with some um, statistics and just kind of give you a um, a brief overview of the work that we're doing. Um, let's see. I'm beginning. And I will share my screen. Oh, I think it said it's disabled. Okay. Try to make you a host here. Or just enable sharing. There we go. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? I can. Okay, perfect. So, um, as was already uh, Whitney Wharton, and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist at Emory. Um, I became involved in LGBTQ research um, only recently, actually, in the last two and a half years. Um, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community, and I live with my partner and our two dogs in Atlanta, Georgia, and I and um, you know, primarily to date, I, uh, my, my work surrounds um, health disparities and how health um, impact health and um, specifically in the dementia space, how health disparities, whether it's subjective indices of stress or biological markers, um, how these things contribute to healthcare and to um, diagnosis and the resources that are available to um, under-resourced communities. And to date, I primarily have been working with the, the African-American community. And, you know, I, a lot of the discussion around health disparities is around stress and what stress does to the body. So the, you know, the physiological ramifications of stress are 
real and clinically relevant and far reaching. So, you know, if someone has higher levels of stress um, due to anything like um, caregiving, um, disparities surrounding housing, transportation, voting issues, um, income, um, you know, these consistent stressors, if they're not addressed over the long period of time, um, they have real clinical implications. So these have the ability to increase our blood pressure, increase our risk for diabetes, and also increase our risk for Alzheimer's disease, which is specifically um, what, what Kelly and I study. So I just was going to start out with a few um, statistics surrounding the LGBTQ community, because as I found, um, you know, I started, you know, I'm interested in my own community. So I started kind of digging into the literature and trying to see what work has been done in the LGBTQ community and if the same health disparities that impact um, other groups are the same for LGBTQ identified, self-identified individuals. And I was just, I, I was so surprised to find that there's literally no data. So nothing, you know, very little exists. And there's only, you know, a handful of us across the entire U.S. that are doing this work, um, specifically in the dementia field. So, you know, as a, as a scientist and seeing this sort of immediate need, particularly in my own community, that's really what spearheaded, you know, our interest in, in becoming um, involved in LGBTQ health. So to give you an overview, um, there are 2.7 million older adults, meaning 50 and over in the United States that self-identify as LGBT. And we think that this is an underrepresentation. And this number is expected to increase to more than 4 million by 2030. Uh, compared with non-LGBT older adults, LGBT adults experience a higher prevalence of chronic disease and disability, as, where, as well as poorer physical and mental health outcomes. And some of these include um, higher rates of smoking, drinking, depression, and um, exposure to violence, particularly in the trans community. Um, all of these things are heightened by um, LGBTQ um, adults who identify as anything other than non-Hispanic white. So you have that intersectionality with race as we go through these LGBTQ statistics. Um, also, we have data to show that LGBTQ individuals are more likely to age alone so we don't have a blood family necessarily that we can rely on, and uh, we're less likely to be married, less likely to have children, and we are more likely to form families of choice, um, families within our own community and neighbors and friends, as opposed to um, families of blood. And this is very important as we talk about aging and the necessity of having a caregiver and the necessity of being a caregiver for our community. So very recently, um, aging disparity related to sexual and gender identity <clears throat> has just now been acknowledged by the National Institutes of Health, the National Academy, Academy of Medicine and the Alzheimer's Association as being a group um, that are disproportionately affected by aging and specifically dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And given these now um, national health objectives to reduce health disparities, um, we have been identified as a specific group that um, the National Ac Academy of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health are trying to focus on so that we can collect data understand where our needs are not being met and understand the unique needs of our community so that we can better serve those, um, serve the individuals of the LGBTQ community. So um, two things I'm gonna talk about. One is LGBTQ individuals with dementia. And then second are LGBTQ individuals who are caring for someone with dementia. 
And this isn't necessarily caring for someone that also identifies as LGBTQ, but caring for someone. Um, we are disproportionately um, caregivers, but also um, individuals within the LGBTQ community um, suffer from higher rates of cognitive impairment um, in comparison to non-LGBT individuals. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we collected some data from 2015 from uh, Medicare and that showed that 18% of trans adults were um, uh, identified as having a diagnosis of dementia compared to 12% of cisgender adults. And that is a um, clinically relevant, statistically significant um, discrepancy. And we're trying to right now parse out the reasons for that, but we do know that LGBTQ individuals are getting dementia and Alzheimer's more often than non-LGBTQ individuals. So caregivers, um, caregiving is for any of us that have, any of you that have done that, um, it is a huge, it's a huge undertaking. And caregiving can mean anything from um, you know, going to the grocery store for someone, um, providing, um, you know, assistance on taking people to a doctor's appointment, all the way to um, people who have power of attorney, um, medical power of attorney over individuals, and then people that actually care for someone in their home or have responsibility for caring for someone that lives in a assisted, assisted living facility. And data right now show us that up to 45% of LGBTQ adults care for a loved one with a chronic illness. And this can be dementia, this can be AIDS, this can be cancer, um, but a lot of us are caregivers. Um, LGBTQ caregivers also report higher rates of physical, emotional, and financial strain compared to non-LGBTQ caregivers. And we are also more likely to help with medical and nursing tasks. So this can be helping someone stand up and go to the restroom, um, you know, transferring an individual. This can be um, changing wounds, um, changing a colostomy bag, um, all things like that. Um, LGBTQ individuals tend to do that more often than not. Um, we're also much less likely to seek out supportive services. And part of this is because of fear of discrimination. So, um, you know, if we talk about hospice, oftentimes for a number of these organizations, there is a, you know, a religious component to hospice. So, um, you know, and in, in also in assisted living facilities and in nursing homes, we are concerned for our loved one because if you know a healthcare worker that works in one of these facilities has the option to assist someone that identifies as LGBTQ or someone that is not, you know, we want to be sure that their attention is paid equally to both. So um, that often has not happened, and that's one reason that um, we we are seeing a lot of older individuals who have been out for a, a number of years um, go back into the closet, particularly around dementia care and hospice. Um, we also have concerns about denial of service, and this is also region dependent. So depending on where you live, you might be more concerned about that than, than other places. And then, um, as I alluded to, also receiving poor quality services. All of these things contribute to our reluctance sometime to seek outside care um, or outside resources. We also just don't know where to go. So a lot of times, you know, we won't know if an ambulance service or a um, assisted living facility or a nursing home is LGBTQ friendly. So we will more likely err on the side of caution. And if you don't have to use one of those services, sometimes you just don't. Um, there's also some differences we found in the, the little data that exist. And this is from um, a colleague of mine who's on one of the, on the study that I'm gonna tell you about in a second. 
Um, and he collected, um, Joel Anderson at, um, in Knoxville, he collected some wonderful data showing that um, LGBT caregivers tend to be, dementia caregivers, um, tend to be significantly younger and more likely to be single than non-LGBT individuals. So, you know, if you're a caregiver, oftentimes caregivers, if they're an adult child or someone taking care of an elderly person, um, you can rely on your spouse, you can rely on your family, um, but we are more likely to, to be single. Um, additional data that he found was that we are more diverse. So LGBTQ individuals are more diverse than non-LGBTQ individuals who are caregivers. Um, and we're also more likely to be um, the adult children um, or another relative or a friend that takes care of an older dementia recipient as opposed to um, a, a, you know, a, um, a heterosexual cisgender individual. So, you know, I'll use myself for an example. Um, you know, I um, care for my mother and uh, I'm not her primary caregiver, but um, as far as doctor's appointments, as far as, um, you know, helping her kind of navigate her, um, you know, uh, battles with cancer, um, you know, it just kind of fell on me because I, you know, have more flexibility in my schedule. Um, I don't have children and my sister who is just a year younger than me, um, you know, even though she doesn't work, um, she does have responsibility of caring for three children. Um, even though she's closer, a lot of times that responsibility falls on um, the LGBTQ sibling. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of these things seem, you know, like we, we know these things will be stressful. So we know caregiving is stressful. And, you know, my concern is that we don't know what the long-term physiological, you know, heart and body implications are um, for being exposed to these levels of stress. And if you compound the stress of being a caregiver with the stress that comes along with being just a member of the LGBTQ community that I discussed earlier, then you kind of get a, you know, a perfect storm of um, factors that can increase our, um, you know, our bodies. So um, that's why a lot of individuals who identify as LGBTQ will um, have higher levels of reported stress and depression and also have increased blood pressure, increased diabetes, and these other biological markers in our bodies that are related to inflammation. And um, if you have long-term sustained inflammation in your body, um, that also affects your brain. And all of these factors that I just mentioned, hypertension, hypocholesterolemia, diabetes, um, and these lifestyle factors that we use to cope with some of these stressors, um, like smoking and drinking um, are all independent risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So the fact that we are caregivers and that we have the added stress of being a member of the LGBTQ community puts us ourselves, even though we're cognitively normal and young right now, it puts us at risk for having dementia later on in life. Um, I'll also mention that um, Dementia and specifically Alzheimer's disease is the number six cause of death among non-Hispanic whites in the US. And Alzheimer's is actually the number four cause of death in black and African-American individuals. So this is already a huge health crisis and the numbers are expected to um, continually increase. And what we are trying to do is whittle away and co collect data to be able to say, um, these are the factors that put the LGBTQ community at risk, and um, that just said you'll end the meeting in 10 minutes, so I'm not sure what that was, but um, and, and try to figure out um, how, can, how we can assuage some of those, some of those issues. 
Um, so the reason that we started this is because number one, as I mentioned, there were no data. So I cannot stress enough the importance of representation by the LGBTQ community in clinical research. There is none. Um, and if we do not have these data, number one, we don't know the extent to which our community is being impacted by caregiving in general, again, whether that's for cancer or for AIDS or for dementia, um, but we just don't know. And what that means is that less money will be allocated to us, to our community by both local and federal funding organizations to help us find what those resources are or help us um, have money for these resources. Um, so first we have to get the data and ascertain that this is a problem and then be able to say, these are the solutions that has, this is the information that we have gleaned from our data that comes from participants in our study. And this is what people are telling us that they need. And then we can provide those. Um, a second is that, a second factor is that these data will help us guide clinical practice. So for instance, um, you know, if I take my mother in for a routine, um, you know, mammogram or a follow-up cancer, um, you know, appointment, someone might say, you know, what about you? You know, you're, are you her caregiver? Are you a member of the LGBTQ community? Do we also need to provide resources for you? And do we need to ensure that those resources are um, LGBTQ friendly? Um, and that is something that every clinician needs to know. So um, we have two studies going on right now. Um, it's kind of under the same umbrella, but the purpose of this is to collect these very important data so that we can know what resources are uh, and what unmet needs there are and what resources that we can provide. So the first part of this is a one-time online questionnaire. And that is a 60 minute questionnaire. And we are um, currently doing this nationwide. Everything's online um, because of COVID. So um, we are going to collect information on medical history, medication history, sleep patterns, mood, diet, exercise, stress, and your experience as a caregiver. And I've put at the bottom a link to the survey, which I hope we can um, put on a, on a website or, or share in the Facebook, uh, or share in, in your, on, your, um, on, on your Facebook, Jennifer. Um, so this is just so important for us to do. And we're looking to um, collect data from about a thousand individuals. And um, this will help us know what, what people's experiences are as caregivers. Um, the second is a clinical trial, and we're calling that, a, that, that, that clinical trial Equality in Caregiving. And this clinical trial is using an existing intervention that has been proven very effective for dementia caregivers. And what I'm trying to do is take this intervention and modify it, everything from the language to um, the support we provide, the information and the resources and make it applicable to the LGBTQ community. Um, this is specifically for individuals who identify as being a member of the LGBTQ community, but you do not have to be caring for someone who would be a member of our community. So you can be caring for, you know, your adult parent with breast cancer. You can be caring for someone with dementia. Um, and what we're doing with this is showing um, four online videos. And after each video, you will fill out a short 15 minute survey saying, this is what you like, this is what you didn't like, this is what was helpful, this is what was not helpful. And most importantly, you know, do you see yourself in that intervention as an LGBTQ caregiver? Um, and if not, what would make it more applicable to you? What resources do you need? And we do that for, for each of the four videos. And then afterward, um, you, will be on, you will be involved in a focus group 
um, with uh, Kelly and myself leading the focus group. And then we just want to have a conversation with and say, you know, this is a, an intervention that's been shown to reduce stress, improve mood, to make you a better caregiver, not only for the dementia individual that you're caring for, but also for yourself so that you know about self-care, you know about resources in your community, um, but what is missing? What would make this a great intervention so that we can just put this online for free? And if you happen to be an LGBTQ caregiver, you can use this resource and hopefully assuage some of the, um, you know, some of the, 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 the stress and um, help have some helpful tips for you about um, caring for someone with dementia. Um, I think that's the only inclusion, and we do um, give compensation for the clinical trial component of this, and I think it's $100 at the moment. Yeah. Um, so after you know completing the focus group, then we'll give you an Amazon gift card for, for $100 to, to thank you for, for your time for doing this. Um, it takes about as long, as, as much time as it takes you to watch the video and fill out the questionnaires and to have a conversation with me. Um, and then after that, you know, we just, we thank you very much and send you a gift card. And, you know, the, what we really get out of this again is just the, um, you know, invaluable information that we can get from, you know, what, what resources we can provide to, to the LGBTQ community. Uh, this is our contact information. Um, Kelly, I should have put yours on here too, but this is um, a couple of email addresses um, including mine. My email is w.wharton at emory.edu. Um, there's a phone number here. And then also this um, third bullet is our um, lab website. So if you want information about dementia in general, if you want information about caregiving, um, any information that is gleaned from this study, we give back to you. So um, every presentation that we give, including this one, um, every manuscript that we publish resulting from the data. Um, we operate under 100% transparency. So we want to give back to the community, not just, you know, kind of, you know, a small monetary amount, but also just the information. And also once we um, finalize the um, LGBTQ friendly caregiver support um, webinar, we will disperse that to, to everyone that wants it. And that will also be for free on our website. Wow, that's going to be amazing. I know I'm looking forward to that. And we'll definitely be helping you share that as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's it for our presentation. Um, if you have questions for, for me or for Kelly, um, we're happy to answer them. Well, how can caregivers sign up? I just want to be sure that people know how they can get involved in this uh, project before we wrap up. Sure. So the last slide that I had, um, one, you know, you never have to talk to me if you don't want to. You never have to call us. Everything can be online if you want to do the survey, which takes about an hour. Um, so people can click immediately on that link on the, for the survey component. Um, if they want to be in the clinical trial, um, then they can decide to do that after they complete the survey, or they can contact us directly, um, me or Kelly or Danielle at the phone number or any of the emails that we provided. Um, and we would be more than happy to, um, you know, have a conversation and give you some more details about the clinical trial if you want that. Perfect. Everything's online. It's open nation. And if um, you know, the viewers might not be, um, you know, might not kind of fit the criteria if they wouldn't mind sharing with other people. Because again, you know, representation in clinical research of the LGBTQ community is virtually non-existent and, and that absolutely needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. We will never be able to understand the needs and challenges of LGBTQ caregivers without the important research projects like yours. Thank you so much for your leadership and the important work that you both are doing. 
Thank you for your time, your energy and efforts to share your work with us today and for helping us to have a small role in helping you to spread the word and help you to raise awareness of this new study and hopefully help recruit new participants. This is exactly the sort of thing that we want to be able to do at the LGBTQ Caregiver Center, and we are truly grateful uh, for the opportunity to learn about your work today. Please stay connected with us at the LGBTQ Caregiver Center by following our hashtag, hashtag LGBTQ Caregivers across social media and through visiting our Facebook page, LGBTQ Caregiver Center. And um, you can also follow us on Twitter at LGBTQ Caregivers. And of course, visit our new online resource at www.lgbtqcaregivers.org. Thank you so much.